This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsilo. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here with uh, Howard Friedman, who uh, teaches at uh, Columbia University at the School of Public Health and also in the Data Science Institute. And he is the author of, of, of this book right here, uh, Ultimate Price, The Value We Place on Life. Now, Howard, this, I think, is uh, great timing on on your part because you managed to get this book out uh, right around right before COVID hit. And uh, we've had to make a lot of decisions uh, in the last year or so um, based on uh, how much we value the saving of life or the uh, extension of life or quality of life. And and so, um, you know, I guess this sits right at the interface of public health and, and data science, but um, is this a topic that, you know, you've been interested in for a long time or did you, did, what drew you to this, to this topic, which intersects, you know, there's law, there's, there's business, there's so many things that, that intersect at this. At yeah. This, I mean, I topic. have been interested in this topic for a long time. Um, the trigger of the interest in how human life is valued was actually the September 11th victims compensation fund, which that really began drawing my attention to the topic. But then as I did work in public health and i of course, was uh, working at Fortune 500 companies for a while, seeing the business perspective. I, I realized that it's a rich topic with very different viewpoints. So I would say my interest uh, stems from almost 20 years ago, but the dotted line I've been seeing since then. So, yeah, the, the whole 9-11 compensation fund is, is sort of an unusual thing, but it did bring these things to the attention of a lot of people. So. Maybe since you start off the book with that story of how Ken Feinberg had to more or less divvy up these funds, could could you remind us exactly what happened back after 9-11? I'd be happy to. So Congress initially was rushing through some legislation related to protecting airlines and other companies from lawsuit risks. And it was mentioned to them that if you're going to do that, you have to have a way to compensate the families of the victims. So a fund was created, Kevin Feinberg was put in charge, and he was given just a limited amount of instructions. It, he was told he has to take some economic considerations into account. Beyond that, though, he had a, a bit of a free reign, and so he created a calculation. And the calculation uh, really took a few things into account. It started with this idea that no matter who you are, there was a minimum value that no matter what, at least $250,000 was placed on the value of the life lost. And then he layered on top of it other considerations, things related to salary, where he capped the salary you could have used in the calculations. So if you're earning millions of dollars a year, he's not going to account for that. He's going to cap it at a little over 200000 And then additional increments based on, for example, the number of dependents, and they subtract it out your life insurance that you coverage you already had. So this was a complicated calculation and there was a lot of wiggle room involved, but the upshot was fascinating, which was there was a huge range in the payouts that the families received. The lowest amounts, like I said, was 250,000, but some families of victims received over 7 million. And the highest payout was actually to someone who was alive, injured, but still alive. And that opened up a whole set of controversies. Why is one life worth 30 times more than another? Why is the payout for a severe injury more than the loss of life itself? So it really galvanized the public to challenge this whole question of how is human life valued? It also brought a lot of people to ask, why does this fund exist at all? After all, these types of unfortunate, whether it's a terrorist attack or a murder or even accidental deaths happen all the time. And why should the government and taxpayer money be spent? But that's really a, an interesting topic for us to debate later, maybe. Yeah, I mean, so many things converge in that situation. But I want to backtrack a, a little bit because um, sitting in the background of all those decisions was this this idea of litigation. And if uh, the fund, if people didn't take advantage of the fund, then they would, you know, presumably sue uh, for sue somebody, right? I mean, they couldn't really sue. Al Qaeda, <laughs> but they they could potentially sue uh, the airlines or or you know um, the the 
the, the, the landlord of, of the trade center or so forth. Um, and so, you know, suing for, for damages when someone is killed, uh, is goes back a long ways. And I, I remember, you know, in my days as an historian reading about, uh, Wehrgeld, right. And this was when, you know, someone killed somebody back in the Anglo-Saxon times. Well, you know, uh, instead of ex- imposing capital punishment to it, say, all right, you got to fork over a certain amount of, certain amount of cash. So, so this has been going on for, for, for a long time. Uh, but, uh, our tort law system is kind of rooted in that. So, so how do the courts deal with, um, civil damages in the event of, uh, of a death? Um, I mean, forgetting about setting aside the criminal damages, I think the way in which most people came to the realization that there was this whole separation between civil and criminal was when, uh, OJ Simpson was, was put on trial, uh, after he was uh, acquitted in the criminal case, he was, um, sued by the, the Goldman family. Um, so when, when damages are, are, are assessed in a, uh, um, wrongful death, uh, how are they calculated? So it, it's a great question, and, and you're right. OG really um, brought many of us the realization of the separate processes and how long you can't be put under double jeopardy, not tried for the same crime twice. Well, you can be tried in a different court system. So, um, you know, in terms of the settlements, it's very interesting because there's a lot of subjectivity to it, and in fact, there's not a good overall database for analyzing this. Uh, you know, the two of us are you know, very much rooted in data science and, you know, we're thinking, well, give me the data set. Let me find the factors that are most predictive. And the answer is doesn't exist. Why? Because first, a, a lot of companies will settle if they feel like it's going to be a big damage suit. The other thing is um, because state laws vary greatly, as well as considerations such as what was the potential earnings of the individual? So let me take a couple of extreme examples for a second in the civil system, and then maybe we'll trace ourselves back to uh, September 11th for a second. So in the civil system, there are some extreme cases. You mentioned O.J. Simpson. He lost for over $30 million. And in that particular case, California law allowed for the jury to consider what was the wealth of the defendant to consider those types of aspects with coming up with a settlement. On the other hand, let's take an extreme case. In New York, there was a case associated with Cheryl Thurston. Now she was living in a care facility, unable to take care of herself. She was supposed to be accompanied at all times whenever she took a bath for her own safety. The care facility failed to do their job. They left her unaccompanied. She slipped, goes into a coma, never recovers consciousness. Within 24 hours, she dies. Her sister sues the care facility. The court case determined that, yes, the care facility was negligent, causing her death. The settlement, though, was for zero dollars. And the judge even described how inhumane New York state law was that they didn't put an intrinsic price on human life. Cheryl was costing money. She wasn't earning money. She was costing money. And then additionally, and this is really the, uh, the line that always strikes me is had she been chattel, like a cow or a chicken, then if her sister would have been, um, would have merited some compensation, but as a human being costing her sister money, nothing. And that's the extreme. So some human beings, as it turns out, are valued at nothing, whereas others many, many billions. And you'll see this in the corporate world as well, the incredible range of compensation, depending on who is the victim. And, and this is because this, this idea that, uh, a human being is an income generating asset and, uh, and therefore it's the, it's the foregone income that is the primary determinant of, uh, you know, what the, what the cost of that human life is. In, in civil courts, that's, really the dominant theme. Now, of course, there's this punitive damage, you know, people wanting to punish the company, but the dominant theme very much is what was the lost income? And this is part of the calculations that came up in the famous Port Ford Pinto case, but it's also part of why Kenneth Weinberg had to put income into his calculation. And when he put income into the calculation, 
That's why some people's lives ended up being worth 30 times more than others. Those who aren't earning any income simply didn't have an input in that part of you know the Excel spreadsheet, shall we say, whereas those who were high earners had a much higher one. It's worth noting that not everyone took Kenneth Feinberg's offers. Those who negotiated it, on average, got more money. They said, I don't accept this offer. They went back to him. It was a discussion, a negotiation, and a certain percentage rejected this entirely and went to the court system itself. And there are groups that won in court. Uh, Cantor Fitzgerald won millions and millions of dollars on behalf not of their family, but of their employees, the death of their employees and the damage to their company. And so is this because the the, the aggrieved parties in these civil suits are the uh, the survivors, right? And so it's really, you know, the, the courts are looking to see what kind of impact the removal of this individual is having on, on the people who are left behind. In a way, it's the, the dead person's not there to, uh, to, to plead their case. That's exactly it. So they're, they're trying to simulate a world in which that person is no longer there and trying to estimate what is the economic impact on the fam. And that's why they look at things like it come. They do look at this question of dependence and, you know, how many people were relying on that person's income. And then you start seeing the dotted line calculation between that and how people start to think about life insurance. And the reason why is when you look into your own life insurance, you start thinking about what is my value? What is my replacement value? If, I, if I'm not around, how much money will my family need in order to have the lifestyle they expect or simply to replace the income I'm earning? So that calculation recurs. It happens in other situations as well. Of course, life insurance is quite different there you you get to pick the number mm -hmm. most people focus just on affordability they they just ask well how much can i pay each month and is this a good number but that's that's kind of how that calculation works but you see the similarities in very different areas of value life and and how the calculations have some connection so so in the tort law context if if you know, if it's a, if it's a high inc a high earner who is is killed, um, that's going to result in higher damages than if a if a low a low income earner. Um, and and the determinants are market income. So if you're a say um, a care provider, right, and you're not participating in in the market economy, even though it would cost an enormous amount of money to hire someone to replace you and provide the same services to your to your children, presumably, uh, because there's no there's no market income. Uh, this this person would be perceived as being less valuable. And it's not perfectly absolute. So you, you know, assuming you have a decent lawyer, uh, she or he will make the case that the loss of the caregiver does incur financial impact on the family. And they will now have mm -hmm. to pay for this. But we all know that, unfortunately, a lot of those services are undervalued. So you end up with this situation that certain lifestyle choices result in people's lives being less valued. And a theme that comes out throughout the book is the lives that are less valued are less protected by our legal systems. Now, in the case of choosing careers, it, it also tracks suit. So someone may have chosen a career that requires a lot of education, but perhaps doesn't earn as much. Maybe some social workers, maybe some yeah. uh, educators. Well, they are providing a great value to society, Maybe they don't have as high of an income as, let's say, a very successful business person who has also earned, uh, has earned a similar level of degree of education. But that huge disparity in their earnings trickles through to how their lives are valued from the court system perspective, on average, as well as how their families will then be protected or subsidized in the case of an untimely death. It's interesting how in, in the business schools, um, we're evaluated and ranked based on kind of uh, uh, post-graduation income. And, you know, for a school like ours, where a lot of our students graduate and go into nonprofits, go into government, go into, uh, you know, occupations where they sacrifice income in order to make impact, um, that, that's going to reflect negatively on our, on our, on our statistics if, if it's purely income well. that is the measure. <laughs> The rankings of schools is highly subjective uh, and subject not only to people weighting things differently, but also a bit of negotiation is a nice way to mm -hmm. put it. Unfortunately, but it also has huge impacts. 
Yeah, but you also talk about corporations, right? So you mentioned the Pinto example. And, you know, I, I've, I've taught law and economics for, for many years. And, and in law and economics, you know, it's, it's a, students are oftentimes kind of shocked and taken aback when you um, explain that uh, companies have to make these difficult decisions all the time, right, as to how much safety to put into a, a product. And you can't completely eliminate, uh, you know, danger, uh, if you're selling a knife, you know, some people, you know, the only, you could sell a knife that doesn't cut and then maybe, you know, fewer people would die, but, but, uh, but you know, nobody's going to buy that. So you have to, you have to think of carefully about these, the, these trade-offs. Um, and so you walk through how companies, uh, think about this and how companies do, do the math. And, and of course it's shaped by the, the, the outcome that they could expect to, uh, experience in, in a court of law. And so this, this idea of, you know, the cost of human life as the, as the courts find it flows back into the, the decision-making. So, so a company, you know, presumably if their product is going to damage, you know, low income people, uh, they would, um, uh, include less safety in that product than if that product is going to damage kind of high income people. Is, is that, is that, do you, do you think that's a, a, a fair assessment of, of how they would go through the math and, and do they actually use the expected liability or, or do they have their own internal calculations in general? So, um, my experience, and of course I've done some of this work, so this is not a hypothetical. Um, there will often be a calculation done, which looks at the investment in safety. What is the corresponding expected improvements in safety, the lower rates of incidence rates, and then what is the financial impact? So cost of the safety versus what will they potentially lose in lawsuits, punitive damage. But in addition to lawsuits and punitive damage, ideally, they think about brand. And brand is important because as you read more and more about companies who could have prevented something and chose not to, that often can have a long-term damage that lasts well, well beyond the short-term perspective that most people, you know, when you're sitting in the C-suites have. Now, it's, the reality is you, a lot of people, they're thinking short-term about how to maximize profits that will link to stock options. But here we are, it's 2021. We're talking about Ford Pinto. Well, Ford Pinto was a case from 50-odd years ago. Ford is still living with that decision. Now, Ford itself didn't do anything so radically different from what happens today. You know, the Toyota acceleration case was only a few years ago. What happened there? Well, in the Toyota acceleration case, there was sufficient data for the company to consider doing the recall, announcing there was an issue with their acceleration system. They chose not to. The settlement was enormous. I think there was less than 100 deaths in the United States. The settlement came in on the scale of an order of tens of 10 to $20 million per victim. Now, if that number is now used in safety calculations that car companies do, I guarantee you they're far more likely to invest in safety. So this is where the legal system is sending a message to a for-profit company. You're going to do these calculations. Here's a number you might want to think about. And when the number's quite high, it will force the company to invest more in safety. That said, and I think you framed it perfectly, companies can't make the most perfect product so that there's never any safety risk. If they do, they'd be out of business because they would have spent so much more on their product than their competitors. So there's a happy middle ground there that has to be found by every company. In this particular case, though, the court is giving them that input. And Ford Pinto, their input actually came from the regulators who back then they used information about salary. Today, regulatory agencies use something called the value of statistical life, VSL, which is actually not linked to income and it's equal for everybody. And that's a point that I talk a lot in my book about because this idea of, you know, you can use an equal value and there's benefits to it and there's risks. But uh, certainly we have lots of examples where it is used. Yeah. So the value of statistical life, I want to spend some time talking about that. But, but it seems that, um, and you know, that's a solution to a problem. And, and the problem is that, um, you know, people subjectively value people very differently. And, and even if, if there is a formula that a judge might use, 
um, if it's a jury trial, you know, a lot of this has to do with the empathy that they might have for the, for the victim. And, uh, you know, some people are more sympathetic th than others. And if, if you, you know, if an innocent child is, is the one that's, that's killed as opposed to a, you know, risk loving, uh, maybe not so reputable person, then, uh, the, the courts, uh, the judge, the jury will probably treat them, uh, differently. And I think you point out that when it comes to things like public safety, uh, and, and other kinds of investments, the, the implied value of, of, of a human life is, is dependent on lots of factors, including, you know, race and, and, uh, the ability of the taxpayers to identify with the, the, the folks that are being protected. Um, so is the, is the value of statistical value of a life, a, a solution to this, this problem where, uh, uh, people have a natural tendency to, um, allow their, uh, subjective biases to, to influence how they, they, they treat different people and their, and the value of their lives. So it's an interesting question. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not a huge proponent of VSL values to dislike for a lot of its economic flaws. But I like the upshot of, which is it's a high number, around $10 million in the United States, and the value it provides to, to protecting human lives and the equity involved. You know, what you're mm -hmm. bringing up, which I think is very important, is in other situations, whether it's court cases or, or other aspects, there is a huge amount of subjectivity, right? So when it's more or less appealing, influences the settlement, when perhaps that shouldn't. On the other hand, I'm also concerned about the objectivity. What I mean by that is when income becomes an input into that calculation, like we said, in civil courts where they're looking at lost income, well, we have very, very well established data related to race and gender income biases. So equal uh, education, equal experience, all things being equal, if women are being paid Call it 10%. I don't know what the exact numbers are because it depends on how the modeling is done, but it's less than men. Well, that lower income translates through to a lower value of that life later if you're using income as an input. Race, when you control for education, on average, uh, Black Americans make substantially less than white Americans. So whether it's a high school degree, college degree, or graduate degree, on average, about 25% lower. Well, that tracks through to how that life is valued, as well as how that life is going to be protected later, because that value in life. Uh, I want to jump back, if you don't mind. You had raised a really interesting point earlier about do companies do a race to the bottom? You know, is, is the idea that if they identify a certain population ha is less protected, do they then invest less in safety? And certainly in some cases, that's true. It's easier to see this cross-border. Opal India, they had the terrible gas accident, 1984. Gas leak, thousands of people are killed. The company eventually reaches a settlement. The settlement was on the scale of a few thousand dollars per din person, per victim. Compare that scale to the settlements that I just described in the Toyota acceleration case. Now, yes, time has gone by. We're not talking the mid-80s versus just a few years ago. But the reality is we're talking complete different orders of magnitude about how life is valued. And a lot of that is because they're talking about American lives, American court system versus settlements in a different country, a lower middle income country. Are companies aware of this? Absolutely. And they certainly make considerations of that when they're thinking about how much to invest in safety in one country versus another. Well, I mean, see, that there's two things going on there, it seems, one of which an economist would be very sympathetic to, right? The idea, and Larry Summers made this point, right, that we should outsource our, our pollution to the countries where, you know, they, they, they don't <laughs> care as much. Uh, you know, well, well, I mean, they're faced with difficult trade-offs. It's like if, you know, if, you're, if, you're expect, if your life expectancy is 30 years old, then, you know, you're, you're okay with a little bit of pollution, right? Uh, and so the idea was let's, let's offshore all of our you know, polluting activities to those, those countries. And I think, you know, an economist would be like, well, of course that makes perfect sense. But then the other thing is, is sort of the nationalism. And I think, um, someone did a study that, uh, you know, in, in the newspapers, uh, one American death is equal to the same number of, of clicks as, 
you know, 10 European deaths, which is the same number of clicks as, you know, a thousand African deaths. Right. So, so, you know, we, we, the, the American public is just, uh, completely, uh, xenophobic and, and discounts the value of lives outside of, uh, you know, the further you get from America, you know, that, that seems to be much less, uh, appealing as a, as a, as a rule. But the, the first one seems like, I mean, why, why doesn't it make sense that we should, um, if we have to locate harmful activities, we put it in those places where people are like, bring it on, come on, I want it, give it to me, right? But, and this I'm will take us back to the hedonic stuff. That. And the reason why I was laughing is the opening to my book used to be that quote. And the response from, I think it might have been the Brazilian ambassador calling it an inhumane. And that was literally the opening to the book, but it's not there. And the reason why it's not there is uh, when I dug into it more as part of my research, it turned out um, he had written it as a joke. It was not a serious statement. He had, uh, Larry Summers had done that. I don't, I, 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 I know enough about Larry Summers to think he, that was not a joke. <laughs> I know that as it turned out, so literally that was, that was the opening of my book until as I dug more into it, I realized, oops, wasn't a good joke, but it was a joke and to, to vilify him. So that said, yeah, it, it is, it is interesting how it works out, you know, truly from an economic point of view, if you kind of turn your brain off and you just think about humans as cash machines, then you will come up with that interpretation, you know, but it's not something that we think I think is equitable or humane. As for the intention part, it's, there's a lot of factors that play into it. You're absolutely right. Nationalism plays into it, but sex plays into this. Mm -hmm. um certainly racism plays into this and and i have an extreme example i talk about in the book which is the tragic case of in new york city young female jogger uh karina vetrano who she was jogging she was raped and murdered horrible situation the media was all over this national media not just new york media at its peak about 100 detectives were working on that one case yep. now contrast that new york city we're much safer than we were when i was growing up but we still have uh, over 300 murders a year murders do not normally have a hundred detectives working on it. and mm -hmm. you know in this particular case i had spoken with one of the lead detectives in all of new york city and what he said to me was it's about the media if the media is focused on this then he will get the pressure yep. that you must close this case and close it immediately. And he will be forced to reallocate his resources to do everything possible to close that case. And he said, he doesn't know, he said, he doesn't know why the media is so attracted to that case, but I think we can be honest with ourselves and understand she is considered to be an empathetic victim. Young, female, attractive, alone, doing a normal activity. Versus what may be considered a less empathetic victim, which is someone who's in the middle of committing a crime and then gets injured, for example. So there's this level of empathy, but there's all these other factors that are playing in that. Or just somebody who's, or just somebody who's from a different walk of life or a different ethnicity, right? I mean, you know, clearly it, people. Unfortunately, yeah. this, this is very much the case. Yes. And, and this is mm -hmm. the America that we have to understand we live in and, and yeah. the implications of it really are that some lives are more valued and more protected than others. They go hand in hand. That level of interest that comes from the media and the public, as a result, drives the allocation of resources. So these are true, true examples and measures. Yeah, I mean, and, and you also mentioned kind of the identified victim uh, phenomenon, right? So, you know, you, you have media coverage of some baby trapped in a well, and 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 so, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars will go towards, you know, rescuing that child in the well, but you know, the ones that don't make it to TV, they, they, they don't get nearly as many resources thrown, thrown their way. Uh, and, and, you know, the studies show that if you have a picture of a child, you know, pointing a finger at you, say like, Hey, I'm hungry, you know, help me out. People throw money at that person. But if you have, you know, a crowd of a thousand starving people, then nobody gives any money. Right. Um, and, uh, and, and so it's that, that ability to, to evoke, uh, empathy that, that drives people's willingness to pay. Absolutely. And it, it, these 
I did the five lives, and you're you're mentioning uh, baby Jessica who uh, was trapped in the well. This is in the early eighties. Uh, so much money was raised for her rescue. None of it was needed. There was no call for sending money. Uh, you know, there was no, um, you know, website opened up to contribute to her fund. There was no GoFundMe campaign in the early 80s for this. Of course, we didn't really have the internet as we know it either. Um, people gave money. They empathized. They were so concerned about it. Uh, mm -hmm. But to that point, the return on investment, the dollar spent per life saved is vastly higher. That money is going to low and middle income countries to support nutrition programs and immunization programs. But that's not an identified life. And to your point, a lot of non-government organizations, they understand this. This is why yep. this organization, Save the Children, it's a wonderful organization. They advertise, they show the pictures of the child. This is where your money's going to go. It's an identified life for you. Um, um, and that really does make a difference. You know, we're human beings and you know, the two of us are math people, but even with our math brains, you can have the statistics and the data, but also you see a face yeah. and the name, and right. you know that's where the money's going. And, and if I get drawn to that too, even though I, you know, I have that thinking, uh, was it thinking fast, thinking slow, Daniel Cowden? Mm -hmm. If I was thinking slowly, I know I'd have a higher return on investment if I sent the money one way, but I'll still send some of it the other way. Yeah, I mean, as economists, you know, we, we, we like to uh, get people to think in terms of you know, marginal benefit per dollar spent. And, and so, you know, we advocate that individuals think carefully about how they allocate their spending and their effort and to try and get the, you know, equalize the marginal benefit per dollar spent. But at the end of the day, people, you know, they, they, they buy a Starbucks and, and they, they don't realize, Hey, that $4 you spent on the Starbucks probably could have saved a life, you know, in, in another country. Um, but at the same time, you know, you're, you yourself are going to spend tens of thousands of dollars to, to, to save a life uh, that's, you know, in, in your closer circle. Um, and so the coronavirus kind of raises some issues. Uh, you know, when you think about at least at the individual behavior level, how we, we think about our own lives. Uh, I remember at the beginning of the football season, uh, hearing about, you know, these football players who were saying, you know, I, I'm not going to play football because I might, might get coronavirus. And I'm thinking, wait, no, you might get paralyzed. Like you might like, you know, you might, I mean, there, there are a lot more dangerous things going on on that football field than, than, you know, than, than coronavirus for you as a, as a healthy young, um, you know, athletic male. Um, so, so at the individual level, we, we, we seem to, um, we don't just think in terms of dying. We think in terms of, of, of dying in different ways. And, and so, so it's not just that we, we don't, we don't equalize the probabilities, but we also seem to think that, you know, there, are, there are good ways of dying and bad ways of dying. And, you know, we can absolutely, and, you know, ski um, down, ski down that, ski down that double black diamond with our mask on. I was actually just skiing. <laughs> <laughs> I was just actually, uh, in, in Tahoe and, 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 you know, everybody was skiing down the double black diamonds with, with, with masks on. And I thought this was, this is kind of a peculiar mishmash of, of risk aversion and risk seeking. Well, it, it, to your point, we people fear different deaths differently. It is quite interesting what resonates. And for many, that long, drawn-out potential hospitalization stay of the intubation, that is much more fearful to them. Mm. A sudden death. Skiing headfirst into a, a tree at 50 miles an hour, whatever speed um, double diamond people do. I don't know. I can barely make it down the bunny slopes. What can I tell you? My point is that the choice of how you want to invest in mitigating risk, um, it's not, it's rarely a rational choice. And, and there's a lot of factors that play into it. But pulling back to your point about the identified lives, you know, there's this classic trolley car problem or runaway train problem. And, and people always like to talk about it in philosophy classes and ethics classes. You know, the train's going down, it's about to hit one person. You can, flip the switch so it instead hits, you know, not a person, but an animal. Everyone mm -hmm. says, no problem, I'll flip the switch. Then you change the scenarios around. I've got five people or one person, and people kind of work through it. And, and these are all hypotheticals, of course. Mm -hmm. But all of those calculations of how to optimize and save the most lives, they all go out the window once you start talking about who are those people. Yep. Am I going to save five murderers? and sacrifice a Nobel Peace Prize winner, well, maybe that's not the right trade-off. Who it is starts to become a factor. 
And then the personalization. Well, what if they're people I know well, friends, relatives? Mm -hmm. And then I think I finish uh, what I describe my, in the book, the last one is, and what if it's you on the track? Would you rather just see those five people killed or, or do you just say, kill me? Yeah. I mean, it's also interesting, you know, who's, who's driving the trolley. So, you know, if it's a jihadist driving the trolley versus maybe a, uh, a computer virus that's, that's driving the trolley, um, you know, during, during the coronavirus crisis, it's interesting that, that, you know, we were unwilling to, um, have sort of challenge trials, for instance, or we're unwilling to have, uh, you know, uh, live um, tests of, of different, um, you know, transmission models, uh, because of medical ethics, we were concerned that, you know, someone might die in the process of discovering this information, but we, we have no problem, you know, tossing somebody into a, a, a firefight in, in Afghanistan, uh, even though that comes at very high risk of, of, of death or injury. Um, it, it's an interesting point about, you know, how, military lives are treated, which unfortunately mm -hmm. is often valued quite low. In fact, I talk about it in the book, when you start talking about valuing human lives, the military actually values most lives relatively similarly mm -hmm. in terms of the compensation if someone dies, and it's quite low. We're talking very low six figures, and that's somewhat independent of rank. We, we don't protect them, and, and we've made many of our military folks the test subjects unwittingly in many tests historically but bringing back to the COVID for you know, for a bit minute because you know we're all kind of still living in this COVID world um so actually my book was released in may of last year so right in the peak of COVID, especially for new york where we have still been the epicenter globally for the world and it was a very difficult time certainly for a book release i have no control over that but it did resonate with the fact that what we see in the COVID crisis is all lives are not valued equally. The exposure mm -hmm. to COVID was substantially higher amongst minority groups. So Blacks and Hispanics still to this day have had much higher rates of COVID deaths than whites and Asians. COVID infections. And now what we're seeing when we start looking at the vaccination rates is the exact same data. So the CDC has published some very clear data about the relationship between COVID morbidity, case rate, and race. And it absolutely mirrors what we see in terms of the inequalities with the vaccination, where vaccination rates are lower for Blacks and Hispanics mm. than they are for, on average, for whites and Asians. Yeah, I want to talk more about that. Uh, so to set the stage for that, maybe we can get into the uh, value of a statistical life, because, you know, I, I used to... Have have Kip Viscusi was a colleague of mine many, many years ago. And, and, uh, and, you know, I, I, I got to know Cass Sunstein at, at some conferences and so forth. And they were, they were both sort of proponents of, of this idea and particularly Cass Sunstein, you know, at OERA was really an advocate of harmonizing the, the value of statistical life across different, you know, regulatory agencies. Could, could you talk a bit about kind of the how this, you know, uh, this concept came into existence in governmental circles as part of the kind of cost benefit analysis drive begun under Reagan and then, you know, reiterated under Clinton and Obama. Absolutely. So take you all the way back to Fort Pinto for a second. Regulators were guiding cost benefit analysis, giving them inputs. And they would say, well, use this amount for what would be the damage associated with someone dying, right? And they were using values that were based on income. Economists recognized that that may not be how people value their own lives. Mm -hmm. And so they started talking about more from a society perspective, how much a human life is valued. Now, there's lots of ways you can do that. One way you can do it is just ask the question of how much is someone willing to take on in terms of risk for an incremental amount of income, right? So pay me a certain amount more to take on a riskier job. Or you can do it the reverse way. How much are people willing to spend more on safety products? And they use these to draw in, try and estimate the calculations of how much is someone willing to spend to reduce an income amount of risk by a certain amount. And they see those ratios. So if I'm willing to spend $10,000 to reduce my risk by a small amount, I could take that ratio. They also look at surveys. So there's lots of data sources they use. Some of them are related directly to 
the uh, workplace. Some of them are related to uh, investments in safety, money you're spending on safety devices, and some are survey based. Yeah, so it's interesting to, to, that there, you know, there's stated preferences and revealed preferences. So the stated preferences are the surveys, you know, where people are asked these hypotheticals. Right. I, I find them to be completely unconvincing because they're, they're, they're I, you know. <laughs> so I, I was hiding away from jargon, but since you've inserted, I will give the jargon. So uh, stated preferences, ask someone and they will give you an answer. Personally, I think those are not meaningful answers at all. Mm-hmm. Then for a lot of reasons, some of them are just simply someone wanting to respond to a survey. Gosh, often you're even compensating someone there. They're going to answer as quickly as possible. There are some quality checks. You try to put in some consistency checks, but the reality is if you get an answer that is not consistent with the order of magnitude you're expecting, or if someone says can't be done, they just throw those answers out. That's standard practice. And I actually quoted, um, Kim Viscusi about the fact that he states that that's their practice, which as a scientist, I don't throw out data because it's not convenient. It's just not mm-hmm. how I learned how to do science. So I don't think stated preference has any validity. Or if it does, it's under the narrow, narrow test of circumstances mm-hmm. you did and doesn't translate to real work. And I'm pretty harsh on that in my book. Yeah. Um, reveal preferences, I think, have a little bit more, but the problem with reveal preference. So let's take the example of the incremental amount that someone requires in terms of salary to do a riskier job. Well, that's great, except they may not know what the incremental risk is, right? They're not aware of it. They didn't do their research in advance before taking the job. They needed a job. They may not have options. They needed a job. Additionally, some people are not risk averse and some people are. Some individuals have a huge range of areas on it. When you actually look at the distribution of revealed preference estimates for VSL, Mm -hmm. it's ginormous. It is not something you would like to do statistical analysis on, Uh, but a number is, is drawn from it. And one of the questions that, one of the questions I would have is, you know, if, when we see all that, I mean, an economist looks at that and says, oh, people are crazy. You know, people have these wildly different, you know, you put them in context A and they're about their, their, you know, their revealed preference is super low and you put another context super high, you know, you, um, uh, you ask them how much they're willing to accept versus how much they're willing to pay and you get, you know, radically different answers. So why don't we just sort of take, meet humans where they are and say, okay, well, you know, if you're willing to pay a ton of money to avoid death by, you know, um, uh, you know, virus, but you're not willing to pay a lot to avoid death by, you know, machinery. Why don't we just incorporate that into our, our cost benefit analysis? Like if these, if, why don't we just take human preferences, if they're systematic in any way, why don't we just, you know, and if, if, if you don't seem to mind a risk that you're ignorant of, then maybe, you know, we should take that into consideration and say, well, you know, what you don't know can't hurt you. Let's put that into the cost benefit analysis. Why are we, why are we saying that humans ought to have uh, a, 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 a consistent value, um, you know, across these, these, these different contexts? I mean, I think some of it is our own rationality. We're trying to layer on top the fact that we don't like the irrationality of the answers. Mm-hmm. Some of it is also, um, you know, for our own perspective. So Cass Sunstein, he does advocate for using the same value for different regulatory agencies. So when you're talking about transportation or the Food and Drug Administration or the EPA, he's saying, if you're doing cost-benefit analysis, that life is still worth the same. Now, you know, your counterpoint is, well, what if people don't value their own lives the same? My death in a car accident doesn't feel the same as my death from lung cancer because of the excessive carcinogens in the air. Well, I I would have to support Cass on this one and say that just from a calculation point of view, it's a lot simpler to do that and to say that the life is worth the same amount regardless of which part of the government is doing the calculation than to have wildly different values. Why we have wildly different values, I think some of that is the methods that are used and some of that is human beings. And, you know, like, Willingness to accept versus willingness to pay is is different in in so many so many situations. That's part of being a human being. So I think I would find myself at, and I'm not a I'm not a strong advocate of VSL because I think I see the holes in it, but I see the value. And to me, the value is 
It's a large number that's applied for all lives, rich or poor, whether you live in the city or the country, black or white, no matter how male or female, regardless of any of these factors, you're protecting the lives the same. So you don't have the risk of a scenario like you described of, well, what if companies target or someone targets the poorest? You don't mm -hmm. have that. It's not an option. And to me, there's a strong benefit in using that. And that, that, that's not an economist arguing at that point. And I'm going to be very honest with you. That's me in my personal perspective of ethics. Not everyone has to agree with me. Now, one of the, one of the critiques of the nice VSL is, <laughs> yeah, one of the critiques of the VSL is that like, you know, on the margin, um, when you're dealing with very small numbers, uh, uh, the, the VSL can be very high, but when you start to deal with much larger numbers, then, you know, you very quickly run out of money, right? Uh, I mean, if you apply a $10 million, uh, VSL and, and we're talking about, you know, 40 million people, 50 million people, well then, you know, we don't even have, we don't have that kind of money. I mean, the average, you know, the per capita income in the U S is $60,000. So, you know, you, you, you really can't spend more than $60,000 per, per life. Right. I mean, you, well, you, you run can. out of cash, but you can't. So uh, with you're, small you're, numbers, but not if you're, if you're talking about saving, you know, 50 million people, uh, you know, the, the plague comes and, and you, you know, you got to spend $50 million a person at some point you run or, out of cash, right? Or a pandemic comes and you're willing yeah. to re, you know, dial back your economy, shut it down and then draw out into debt on the scale of trillions of dollars. But here's the interesting thing, Greg. And once again, I, I find it fascinating, but. If you look at what, had, had you take a, a neutral scenario, right? Government takes no action whatsoever. Well, if we assume that case fatality rates are somewhat representative, then you know, you've got a risk of a few million people who could have died from COVID, right? And so these actions are trying to save a few million lives. Take a few million, multiply it by $10 million per life, and you've literally got the trillions that we've just experienced in terms of the drop in GDP and then the corresponding, you know, additional investments related to, uh, investments in the economy, the PPP, et cetera. So we're, we walked into the same order of magnitude that a regulator would have done if they had just blindly said, take the BSL. This is my worst case scenario. And, and of course, no country did the worst case scenario. No country said, I'm just going to ignore it completely. Let's just let this thing run wild. No country did that. But had we done that, our counterfactual would have put us in the scale of what we just experienced. So interestingly, it can happen. Now, to, very much to your point, you, 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 you picked your number wisely. You said 50 million and I pulled it down in order of magnitude <laughs> right. because you're right. Yeah. We don't have it for 50 million. But pull it order and manage it down, and that's exactly what we just experienced or are experiencing with our counterfactual yeah. right now. Yeah, I think it's going to be, you know, the historians are going to have to figure this out. But, you know, if if you believe Larry Summers' number that, you know, the, this is an $8 trillion um, intervention uh, in the U.S., um, and uh, then, you know, figuring out how many lives we actually saved as a result of this $8 trillion, you know, this is a very difficult exercise. You have to make assumptions about infection fatality rates and case fatality rates and so forth. Um, but you know, if we, if we imagine that we saved say half a million lives, um, you know, that, that works out to be a fairly, fairly large number. Um, and, and I think that if, if you were to hand a public health official that budget and say, Hey, you got $8 trillion, uh, save as many lives as you can. I think probably they would say, you know what, let's, let's just, tackle smoking instead because smoking is half a million people a year uh and covid is you know unfettered say two million you know one shot deal who knows maybe people would say that we're, we're we should be spending it on smoking but but people don't seem to care much about smokers they, they're they're uh they, they kind of chose their own death and so we don't really uh we don't really, really, we don't really want to save them. Uh, is, well, it, it, it's a little bit back to your point about empathy, right? So mm -hmm. which why do I more empathize with someone who chose their risks or someone who did not? Um, so you, you put out a lot in that and, and it's worth picking up on a few of those uh, concepts. The first one is, yeah, so unfettered, a few million, 
And smart people can debate whether it would have been two million or five million, but let's call it somewhere in the few million range, unfettered COVID. Um, the price that we've paid for it is in the scale of trillions, and whether it's whatever number you 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 know, I think you said eight trillion, uh, Larry Summers. I, I don't know. I'm not going to pretend that I've done the calculations, um, but I know it's on the scale of oh, a few trillion. So whether within a factor or so, I, I think you've raised an extremely interesting point, which is more of historians can look back. They can say, well, if you had this amount of money that you were willing to invest, how would you invest it? And I think, yeah, they they would probably say, I could have optimized my system. And the optimized system is, well, what am I optimizing? Is it the dollar spent per life saved? Is it the dollar spent per life year saved? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or some other metric. And, and the metric matters. And I talk about this a little bit in my book because you will, you will save different lives depending on the metric. But I think you're right. If we had walked into 2020 saying, we're going to write a check, call it $5 trillion, call it $10 trillion. How do you want to spend it to save the most lives? We probably would have made different choices. Diabetes, or, maybe, or, you know, cancer. Um, so uh, you mentioned cancer. I, I think because you, you, you raised a very interesting point, which is a lot of people view that those, you know, an individual in 2021 who's smoking has to be aware of the risks. And, and mm -hmm. there is something of a free will and people being able to choose their own risks as long as they're not damaging other people and they may suffer consequences from it. Of course, I talked to Robert Frank and he, 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 he believes that, uh, smoking is, should be treated like a virus because, uh, you know, when you pick up smoking, you tend to induce others to pick up smoking. Um, and, and so it's an infectious, uh, disease, at least in his, his view, his empirical, uh, analysis of, of it. Um, as the as the child of two chain smokers, um, not statistics being argued right now, but <laughs> anecdote being argued. Warning to all of your readers, but um, or your listeners, uh, I'm arguing anecdote. But my anecdote is, yeah, well, yeah. So the same with COVID. You can be sitting next to someone with COVID and not get it, but. Um, but, but you mentioned quality, right? And in the book, you talk about, you know, life years and, and, you know, this is a very different way of thinking about it. Right. Um, and you know, with our COVID intervention, you know, we're saving lives. We talk about saving lives versus, you know, killing people, but in reality, there's no such thing as saving a life. There's only extending a life. Uh, and there's no such thing as, you know, killing someone. There's just shortening a life. Right. And so as an economist, you know, you like to think of the integral, right. You know, the, the area under the curve. Uh, so to speak. And, and so, you know, if you do a code blue on someone, uh, and you know, you spend a hundred thousand dollars to do a code blue on someone and you buy them like two more days of life, um, you know, that hundred thousand dollars could have, you know, vaccinated, uh, you know, 10,000 kids, uh, for some life threatening disease. So, um, so, so do we, should we, should we think of, or even Suppose that hundred thousand dollars could have saved one child, as opposed to delaying the death of a of a uh, comatose person by a day. Um, th does it really make sense to talk in terms of binary, you know, lives, non lives, as opposed to you know, uh, life extension and putting some kind of quantitative metric on 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 life extension? So it it is a very interesting point, right? You know, the metrics that you can talk about, you can talk about quality adjusted life years. You could talk about disability adjusted life years. You could talk about life years. You could talk about life. Um, and there's probably some more, some variants of that. I, I think that we, we should consider some trade-offs, but we have to be quite careful because um, this is the perspective. You know, if we're looking from a society point of view, once you start layering in this question of, do I maximize my dollar spent per quality adjusted life year versus life year, then I valued one person's life versus another based on perhaps a physical disability. Was that the right thing to do? I argue no. When you start talking about life years versus life <clears throat> and lives saved, well, then you automatically valued young lives more than older lives. And 
I understand, of course, the argument for doing that, but I think there's also a strong counter argument, which is the person living may not agree with that assessment. You can argue, well, they are the ones who contributed to taxes over time. So you can make strong arguments both ways. Um, I do think it's problematic just to simply blanket use an equation that values some lives more than others without reflecting the fact that other people have other priorities. When you talk about disability adjusted life years, well, that doesn't reflect how that person may enjoy their own lives. Yeah. So I, 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 I find it yeah. challenging and problematic. It's worth noting that um, these are standard metrics and standard debates. What I mean by that is there is this concept, disability adjusted life years. People use it. People use quality adjusted life years. At the same time, people also look at overall survival, OS, when you talk about an intervention. And why is OS important? Because at its core, it's easiest to measure life and, and people don't debate too, too much whether someone's alive or dead, but you can debate the metrics used for disability adjusted life years and quality adjusted life years. And I talk a bit in the book about the Terry Schiavo case because that was an extreme example where for mm -hmm. so many years, a woman was maintained on life support, no viable brain functions, went all the way to the Supreme Courts and, uh, you know, the, in order to resolve the situation where, as it turned out, at, when all the expenses were added up, there's hundreds of thousands of dollars were spent to maintain a life that all doctors had said was not going to be viable. And then once she was turned off life support, what the doctor said was true. It's a tragic story, but also the reality of a misallocation of resources from an economics point of view. So the human being problem, but also the economic problem as well. Yeah. I mean, one of the different, one of the important differences is, you know, uh, when people are in the moment versus thinking about being in the moment and the preferences are very different. So if you ask someone when they're young, like, Hey, you know, how much of your, you know, current income would you like to set aside to keep you, uh, you know, alive, uh, you know, in, 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 in a, in a, you know, seriously impaired state, most young people would say, no, no, I don't want to, I don't want to spend anything on that. Like if I find myself, you know, quadriplegic, I, I'm, I don't want to live. But then of course, when they become, if they are in that state, they're like, well, of course I want to live. Right. So, so, you know, which, which of those preferences are we supposed to respect or honor when, when they're both uh, within the same individual? Which, which is a good reason why you should update your health proxy regularly. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, I joke of my family, which is I tell them, listen, if I'm in a, a, a situation like that, spend every dollar we have as a family. If you have to live on the street, <laughs> oh, do all those things, but keep me alive. And my better half is like, no, not going to happen. <laughs> no, right. like, uh, okay. <laughs> right. Well, so, so this, I mean, it raises some interesting issues though. Uh, if we consider lives to be, you know, all lives to be equal, uh, because, um, you know, a lot of people are arguing that there's a substantial amount of evidence to, to support the notion that all of these children who are deprived of education, right? If every year of education adds not only to income, but also to life expectancy. And so if we've had 73 million children in the U S who have had to, um, uh, experience an educational, uh, deficit over the last year, then that means that every single one of those 73 million people is, has a shorter expected life expectancy as, as a result. So does that mean that we've killed well, 73 million people? I would give them our, a lesson our... on causation and correlation that um, the year of education alone did not cause the increase in life expectancy. Uh, education, and we're talking formal education, is going mm. to be correlated with a lot of factors, including higher income. On average, mm -hmm. it'll be correlated with better health standards, better health insurance. It'll be correlated with many, many factors. Yeah that are related to life expectancy, but the degree or the extra year of education didn't make you live longer. And well, I mean, so I think you're absolutely, you're absolutely, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. For anyone who makes that argument, right. I, I would talk to them about correlation and causation. No, no, I think you're absolutely right. I think that they're, they're, you need to disentangle them and, and, you know, short of a, uh, an RCT, I don't know whether we could, you know, uh, tease that out, but I think there, you know, there have been some, some natural experiments, uh, and, and that have been done. And, and I've, I've, I've read about some of the natural experiments where, 
uh, there were, you know, teacher strikes and some other things. And then people tracked longitudinally what the, what the impact was on, uh, on various out, outcomes. Um, and so I, I think there, there's fairly strong agreement that, uh, educational impairment will have some downstream consequences that are negative. Now the magnitude and the extent are, are unknown, but, you know, suppose that it reduces life expectancy by a day for every a uh, student that was impaired. Does that mean that we, we, you know, we killed 73 million people or does, 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 you know, the short, you know, a one day life expectancy reduction, you know, should probably be, be, uh, you know, more or less ignored compared to the, uh, um, I, I think you know, our data is not so good on that, but let's, let's flip it around. And instead of killing people or shortening life expectancy, let, let's talk about kind of delays, right? So, um, show bomber. Yeah tries his attempt in the airplane, right? Mm. Not a very good attempt, right? In the middle of an aisle, he's trying to light up a sneaker. Nonetheless, he gets stomped. Well, since that time, though, we've all had to go through substantially enhanced mm. security measures related to that, including taking off your sneakers or shoes and passing them through uh, a screener. Mm -hmm. Take that delay, just to take off the sneakers and put them back on, multiplied by the number of air travelers and you'll have a pretty big number. So we could talk about what the investment in safety versus the expected lives saved, but we know a cost in terms of at least productive time. I, I'm not considering yeah. the time it takes me to take my sneakers off, put it on the little uh, conveyor belts and take a, put them back on later as being productive time. That's a pretty big number. Yeah. That's a lot of years that have been spent now. Has it saved lives? I, I don't know. I know we haven't seen someone light a sneaker up in the middle yeah. of an airplane <laughs> since then, but right. I don't know if that was a high risk before either. Yeah. And, and then, you know, for an economist that, that becomes, it becomes very problematic because it, it seems like that's primarily in the service of improving perceived safety and, and perceived safety might have a value independent of actual safety. And at what level do we, you know, should we be playing to the appearances as opposed to the reality? And, you know, I think Afghanistan cost a trillion and Iraq cost a trillion. And, and I'm not sure, you know, we could ever find out if there were any lives saved at all. Uh, net, net. Um, my, my guess is if I had to, I, I have no evidence to support this, but my guess is that probably we had negative lives saved uh, as a result of those, uh, those, those interventions. I, I'm curious when you say negative lives saved, whose lives? Americans? Or just even yeah, I mean, well, clearly, if you include if 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 you include humans in general, it'd be negative. But if I would think even if you include Americans, um, it, it's probably negative lives saved if you if you factor in all the 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 military deaths. So I think it, to me, it's a very interesting question. One then, I haven't seen people try to assess. To your point, there's no counterfactual. We've got one planet yeah. that we're moving forward in time on, but, um, I would love to see, uh, I'd love to see you write an article about that. I'm interested in, in the thought process. It'd be science fiction, <laughs> you know, right. <laughs> but, uh, but look, this, this is really, I, I think we could talk about this. There's so many issues that you raise in, in the book. Um, we didn't even talk about kind of life insurance, uh, and, and how people think about that. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, and, and discrimination in particular, uh, in the area of, of, of life insurance and what should be considered. And, and, you know, there's more and more, um, legislation out there trying to advocate for, you know, gender neutral, uh, life insurance and gender neutral, um, uh, you know, uh, annuity pricing and so forth, which would you know, lead to cross subsidization. I think that there's some, some profound consequences there, but, uh, alas, we, we do have to, uh, draw it to a close. So, um, what's next on the agenda? Do you have another book in, in the pipeline? What I have is book proposals with my agents and agents need to do a good job of, um, signing deals. I, I wrote a, what I thought was an interesting book that introduces data science to middle school, uh, mm. uh children. Um, but you know how the well, that, publishing world is. We've got to, we got to find a publisher who wants that one before it'll see the light of day. Well, I, I'm a strong proponent of that. I, I, I've, in a couple other podcasts, I've talked about how I think, um, you know, we, we need to stop teaching trigonometry and start teaching statistics. 
uh, because it has you know much more usefulness and it, it's kind of like the critical thinking of our day uh, as we you know the, the they, they students don't often get critical thinking in other disciplines and so you know we need to get get data science in the curriculum well thank, thanks a lot Howard for for uh, uh, for for joining me ultimate price check it out um, and uh, let's let's hopefully host you sometime out in the Bay Area I would love it thank you so much it was really a pleasure chatting with you this is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. 